Hey folks, Dr. Mike here with the now titled Mike Ezra Tell channel. Chris Williamson said that it's good to title things just your own name and said, get rid of the making progress. That's what he said. So we listened because he knows things and uh, we're still making progress. But um, now that your channel is just called my name. So welcome to bullshit ideas I had about various things and going to be expounding on them. My old outdated laptop is still booting up, Scott. Isn't that nice? It's telling me to go to Lenovo Vantage, which I don't know what that is, but I don't want it. I don't want it, Lenovo. You make a great laptop. Today, we're going to talk about an interesting topic near and dear to my heart of why do jobs exist? Why do people have jobs? We're going to examine why jobs exist. And then we're going to break out into a couple of implications of we really think through why do jobs really exist. They exist for some reasons, but not for other reasons that many people think jobs exist for. Once we break out and try to find out some applications and implications of this, we're going to get into some really curious shit and hopefully get you guys a little better understanding of kind of more of the human intuitive feel of how the economy really operates. Because you can take an economics class and learn all the equations and calculations and be able to you know, find demand, supply curve intersections and things like that. But sometimes what's missing from the textbook rendition is like, well, what does this really mean sort of thing? And that what does this really mean? Almost a philosophical take can be pretty powerful and can at least help you make more sense of the world and maybe even help you make sense of how some policy decisions could be better or worse than others, being that we sort of pin down the very basic idea of well, what work is. So why do jobs exist? Why can you get a job somewhere? This means jobs in the economy. It does not mean working for yourself. Like if you churn your own butter and consume your own butter, jobs exist because there are problems in the world that need solving. But here jobs, we mean like actual jobs you go to and do a job for someone else. There are four layers of description of why jobs exist. I'll start with the first one. The first one is that people want things to be different in their lives. They want things to be better. This betterment is usually delivered either by goods, like I need food and I don't have any, or services. I need a massage, but I don't have anyone to give me a massage. Because people want better things in their lives, that is why fundamentally all jobs exist. Because if people were no longer willing to trade the equivalent of their labor, their own money, for something out in the world, they need nothing from anyone else. All jobs go away. We'll get to how that could happen in a certain sense in the near future. But fundamentally, people want things to improve about their situation and they're willing to purchase goods or services. Number two, goods and services don't just really exist in the ether. Goods and services are almost always produced and supplied by corporations. So now we know why corporations exist, to team up people and capital in order to supply the goods and services that people demand, that they want to pay for and they have the means to pay for and they're interested in paying for as long as it solves a problem for them, makes their life better. Now, when you have a corporation that's producing some good or service or many of them, you have slots in the corporation for jobs. And the job it doesn't say job. It says a requirement to produce a certain aspect of that good or service, which might be you're the person at the shoe factory that makes the wooden sole of the shoe, or you're the person who designs the shoe, or you're the person who makes sure that outgoing orders and receiving orders match up and everyone's getting the shoes that they want. Whatever role you have. In the corporation, there's a slot for your role, and that slot, okay, so we have the central circle here is human desire for betterment. Then we have corporations, all different corporations around in a circle, supplying those goods and services. On the outsides of these corporations, at the very ends of them are these little kind of like, if you think the corporation is kind of this bent rectangle, there's like a piano key is looking bent rectangle, and each piano key is a job at that corporation. So that's the third circle. And then outside of that, 
are a bunch of things in this ether that we could clip in to those piano key slots for tasks that need to be done, and those then become filled jobs. But we have three options at least of what to put in there. One is animals, like a seeing eye dog clips into whatever medical corporation hired the dog to have you know its owner get walked around horse and buggy type of stuff, bomb dogs, so on and so forth. A human could fill that role in all the ways that humans do work. It's probably the most ubiquitous role filler or almost the most ubiquitous role filler. Then we have machines. And machines have filled roles that don't require lots of intelligence, but lots of brute force and repetitive tasks for a long time since, you know, the first industrialization processes began. But machines are incrementally now more and more able to fill even intellectual tasks and start sort of by proxy competing with humans in a sense for those slots. And then lastly are hybrid teams. Some jobs aren't so good for a machine or a human or an animal to do, but a team of some combination of two or several more of those things can do a really great job. Like it's one guy's job in special forces to handle the dog. That guy's good by himself, but he's much better with the dog. If you just take that dog and give it that job, it has no idea what to do. It also doesn't have a handler who's competent, so it just bites one of the spec ops guys on the same team, and you're like, fuck, goddamn dog bit me. Where's the handler? And the handler needs night vision goggles. He needs a really uh, well, well kitted out rifle. That's machines. So there's your ultimate example of a human machine animal hybrid team guy with military dog with rifle and night vision goggles. Then, you know, well on our way to, to making sense of how that would work in real life. So those are the four layers. We got the potential employed machines, animals, and humans on the outside. On the next level, we have slots into corporations for where a job could be. The next level is, of course, those corporations. And the corporations produce goods and services, sending them to the central core philosophical layer of people want goods or services that are going to, at least as they can appraise it, make their lives better in some way or another. Not objectively better, subjectively better. And there's a lot of overlap between those. It's not 100%, but that's the key. So anytime we look at jobs and the idea of jobs, you know, like, President Obama used to say jobs are really funny. My friend Ben does a better impression than that. Jobs, jobs. Once you get the jobs, it's all jobs, jobs, jobs. And politicians treat jobs as if the job is the central thing. And around it's a job. And then we have a, a family who gets food and the community and then a society. That's a way to see it. But it is not ultimately the most refined way because the very genesis of work is because someone wants the thing that you are in a corporation typically slotted in to produce. Now that we have that ultra structure visible in our brains, we can start to navigate it and ask a few questions about what does this exactly imply for at least a few things with regards to work? What does understanding work as being centrally anchored in by people's desire for better goods or services. First implication that I can think of, and I think I have roughly four to discuss. The first implication is that we can now get a little bit more clear in asking the question of, is it good to mentor imperfect people who you already employ to do their jobs better or fire them and replace them with others. There is a way to think about this from the perspective of that human person. It's their job. You getting rid of them on the cold calculus of corporate profit is fucked up. And that has its own emotional validity 100%. It's sad. Firing people sucks. But Remember, the person's job is not really their job. They're just the person for the job. The job stands completely outside of them. Whatever they do, someone else could, to some extent, better or worse, do that same job. So there's a replacement fact there. And on a deep moral philosophical understanding, that person having that job is not the most important thing to try to concern, or sorry, to try to to conserve. 
what we are trying to conserve slash don't need to conserve because it's a reality in the world is that people want certain goods and services. What we want to try to conserve is, is our corporation with either that person, that person trained up better, or another person or machine animal combo altogether going to be the best thing acutely locally we can do in the corporate setting today to make sure that either goods and services continue to stream into that end user at their desired pace and cost, or we can provide better combination of goods and services for potentially even lower cost. That's the real question to ask as someone looking over a corporation and be like, do I fire or hire? What do I do is who's going to do the job of delivering to the customer the best end user experience? That's the fundamental question. Other questions are important, but that's the most fundamental one. And the answering that depends on a few things. First, how well is that person who's already at the job doing an okay job, but you want it done better, how well are they going to do after mentoring compared in output and quality versus a new hire? And that's a complex answer. You could have a variety of answers to these questions. By the way, one could be like, this guy sucks. Anyone's going to be better in like a few weeks. This is not a life or death job. Get rid of them. Fucking start training the next person, hire them in. It could be like, look, Bob's not the best person in the world at his job. But he's like three quarters of the way there. And with appropriate mentoring, we honestly believe we can get it to like 95%. In order to replace Bob, we would have to train someone up for like several years to do remotely as good of a job. Some jobs are like that. Like you got to know the thing that you're doing, not the general thing, the specific thing. And there's no courses. There's no eBooks. GPTs don't know about it. It's like Bob runs this one weird machine in the back of our factory. The machine does this thing we really need. They stopped making machines like this a while back. We're not to the fourth industrial revolution level yet where we can just make a machine, make us any component to replace anything. So we kind of need that to exist. Bob is older. He knows all the ins and outs of that stupid fitzy fucking machine. And if we mentor him up, he's going to get even better at it. There's no one realistically to replace him because no one's going to take the job at an appropriate talent level because they're like, this is an extinct dinosaur I'm going to be working on. Like, yeah, it's going to take you 10 years to figure out how it works. And then you're finally going to get job security. JK, we're actually going to decommission this whole part of the plant in 10 years. But Bob is 63. So he doesn't give a shit. And so in, in, in that version, you keep him, even though he's not perfect, because the realistic alternative is either not going to arrive realistically, it doesn't have to arrive because we're decommissioning this whole part of our business at some point, or it's just going to arrive too late. Like sometimes at our company, RP, we want to hire new software developers, but we realize that mentoring and training up software guys to work with our stack and our system, it's going to take some time. So we're like, is this the best time to do it? Or do we hire later? Or do we not hire at all? Very, very deep question. But remember, all of the thinking here isn't about like how it's going to affect the person. That's a separate sociological concern and an important one. But on pure business concerns, who can do the job the best? By the way, you can take this entire talk, replace job with like sport athlete thing to that you know got the shirt today J job with like team position in sport and replace everything with the fan gets the best experience they want slash the winning is the highest and it's the whole thing you replace corporations with teams replace slots with people that could be in various positions same exact ultra structure so you know when you're getting athletes in yeah like this guy's been your, you know, dedicated center in basketball on your team for years, but like, how good is he? Does he play well with the offense? If he plays super well on his team and he's a great role player and he's kind of the core of the team, even if he doesn't put 30 points a game up, but he puts 15, but he gets tons of rebounds. He has a great court presence. He's a captain. The guys love him and he gets, you know, plenty of uh, assists and stuff. As a team player, he's worth it. And you're like, well, should we like recruit another center or pay a free agent a ton of money to come start coaching up to get that center position? Like maybe, but like, you know, we really got to think it through because, you know, this guy's got maybe another five years of leading the team pretty well. We got him on a pretty fucking decent contract. Let, let's not replace him yet. You know, when he says to us, like, hey, guys, I'm ready to retire, then we'll make a move in that regard. So similar kind of idea. Another thing this depends on of do you replace that person or not? It depends on time and money and training by others in the organization, which was just alluded to, and by opportunity cost of their time of mentoring and hiring a new person. So basically what I just said with the software engineering thing at RP, that's exactly what that is. Our engineers could be building stuff for the company. 
Or they could be building less stuff and training more people to build more stuff in the future. How long do you have to train them? How good do you think they're going to be? What is your plan for them afterwards? Is it just another role player, another code monkey? Or is it someone who makes big architectural decisions and big business decisions? Different calculus there. Notice none of this has to do with the ethics of is it, you know, should we keep the job or cut the job? Remember, when people get on the news and talk about these big corporate layoffs and these evil companies, companies are not existing to give you a job. They don't exist for that at all. The job exists only because people demand goods and services. And if you lose your job or gain your job, it's because of the way the company decided to go about giving the people goods and services at the end. That's who jobs are for. The big thing to remember in this case is the end product, quality and price and dependability of goods and services is way more central to the process than the job or the person doing it. Because remember, the job, you could have a different job made differently. The corporation presents the product or goods and service in a different way. The corporation's not going anywhere. The job slots could be different, and the people filling them could be different. And that's okay. Remember, there's I end up going on this channel and just defending capitalists and billionaires. Well, fuck it, somebody's got to do it. People rag on, you know, corporate head honchos for like, you know, firing people. And they're like, how, how could they? You know, GM, how could they? Um, okay, fine, fine. I hear you. It sucks to get fired. But when you leave a perfectly good job because you got a better chance somewhere else, do you like cry rivers of fucking tears for that company you left? Nobody ever does that. They're like, oh, I'm up, up to bigger and better. And the company's like, great, you're going to do great. We're going to, we hate losing you, but see you later. No one's ever like, dude, how could you leave Ford Motor Company after all the years? Like they were lying on you. That's your team. What are you doing? You're like, dude, what the fuck's wrong with you? It's just another job. Well, same logic can be put in the other way of like, when you get canned from a place and you have to go look for work somewhere else, you're like, dude, how can you guys let me go after all these years? Like you would have done us the same way. And they're right. They never say that because corporations rarely defend themselves, but I'll do it. Fuck it. Why not? So to put this in a more emotional note, because right now I, I know that some folks listening to this, myself included, have this feeling of like, dude, you're just like defending corporations and ragging on regular fucking people who need a goddamn job. And they have kids to feed at home and all that shit. And that's valid as fuck. However, to bring to a point why it's super important to be endpoint valuated, to be concerned with what, what is the purpose of jobs at the end is to give people high quality products and services and whatever arrangement of corporations of job slots and of animals, humans, and machines it takes to get that highest quality of output. That's the most important part of the decisional calculus. Yes, other parts of how is it going to affect that human? Are they going to be able to buy their groceries? That is also a part, but it's not the most central and it's not the most important for a few reasons I'll get into in a little bit. To put it emotionally with an example, it's much more important that the little girl gets her bionic eye implant installed so she can live a full life with normal vision versus that your current head engineer in charge of the bionic eye division keeps his current cushy job with you versus being let go to bring in another engineer to do a better job so that that engineer that used to work for you can go to another cushy job. There are two ways to look at employment currently in the United States as of this filming in September, October 2024. If you are at the bottom rung of the skill set ladder, there are always something like 500,000 or more jobs in the United States completely unfilled that you can get instantly. Most fast food restaurants have no employees to employ anymore. My Chipotle down the street, I always bitch about on this channel, closes every other fucking day because there's not enough TikTokers to go in there because they're on fucking TikTok. There's just not enough humans. The other thing is people who are very qualified and do a really good job and make lots of money and then they get let go, those people have like a near infinite plethora of options to go to for other businesses. They're going to be just fine. And here's the thing, short of some weird dystopian hellscape, Everyone who lets go from work, almost everyone, is going to be just fine. They're either going to get a new job somewhere else or get a new job instantly somewhere even better than when they were fired from or let go, however you want to use that term. So it's important to make sure that we're on the same page on that, that if we have 
lots of people gainfully and happily employed in an economy, we actually haven't even answered the question of, is the economy really producing things of value and thus objectively raising the standards of living of its people? If I have people very happily, gainfully employed, digging up ditches and filling them back up, I can do 90% of the economy employed like that and nothing is created. Everyone lives for at least a few weeks in total despair. There's no more food production. There's no more energy grid. There's no more hospitals. There's nothing, nothing. 90 some percent of the workforce is just gone completely. Everything collapses and then everyone dies of hunger. But everyone had a job. That's because we were looking at it from the wrong perspective. If whatever we do to the economy, jobs, no jobs, however it affects that, makes the ultimate vector of high quality goods and services, then we're really affecting something that really affects every single body. So if everyone's job is doing something, the end point of which is super awesome goods and services, and that trajectory keeps improving, we are winning. If we just make sure people are gainfully employed and we don't ask about what is the nature of work and why do they work, we could have people just just absolutely destroying resources for no reason at all. What matters is the little girl's eye, that that gets done well, that your iPhone works. Can you imagine if your iPhone just kept crashing and you called and you had super high connect lawyers and you made tons of calls to Apple HQ and they finally let you talk to someone important and they're like, look, candidly, like – the guy who heads the iPhone, like, don't break down division, he's the fucking guy. He basically has tenure. We can't fire him. And he's just like, he's out of work. Like, he's in Malaysia on holiday for two weeks. We just can't reach him. And he's too fucking loaded. He doesn't give a shit. So, like, your iPhone's just going to crash for the next two weeks. Hopefully, he'll get back. He'll fix it. You'd be like, what the? You'd be livid. What the fuck is going on? Fuck that guy. Fire that guy. And you'd be right. Because what matters is what you paid for is high quality. That's the purpose of work. Which brings us to point number two of implications. That was all number one. What does job creation by government programs really look like or what should it look like? Because people assume that like you make jobs, uh, people work in jobs, uh, they get paid by the job, mm, and then they have money to spend on their themselves and their family. So everyone's taking care of like, okay, they pay taxes. Okay, super. And they use the excess money after they've paid for their families and taxes to go buy all kinds of goods and services in the economy. And that's how the whole thing goes, which is true. But where does that initial money to pay them for the job come from? There are two options on that. One is it is residual income from providing amazing goods and services to people. And they're like, I don't want to pay you a dollar for this. I'm going to pay you $2. CEO gets a chunk of that. All the other workers get a chunk of that and Mr. Employee with the job gets a small slice multiplied by 500,000 customers a month or whatever, and boom, he's got a great salary. The other place where it can come from is money is diverted from some other part of the economy. It doesn't really help much of anything. And let's say through the government, it just creates jobs. And then so you're paid to do a job and no one actually knows if that job produces more value than it consumes. It could produce some more value than it consumes, but not enough to pay you the paycheck you're getting. It can produce negative value, can drain value, but you still get the paycheck because government still gives you your paycheck. And because it collects money from the taxpayers every year, it doesn't quite give a fuck about nearly as much about where that money goes. So when we look at sometimes there's roles for governments, not often, in job creation. Why do I say not often? The market creates the best jobs on average because the market by the price system really figures out what the fuck people want, how much of it, and when, and high, how, how high quality, and at what price. Because that market mechanism is so powerful and so illuminating, we want to have as many people unemployed until that mechanism tells us where to go. It's the ultimate society team running mechanism. When there's a lot of money to be made doing something ethical, you should probably have a lot of people ready to do that. Imagine if you had government employing all the engineers. And then like we needed to build rockets and shit, like stuff the government doesn't do, like Elon Musk does, but there was nobody to hire. That would suck. So normally you don't let government do job creation programs because the market creates the best kinds of jobs, jobs with actual supply and demand, super vetted. However, there are times when the government is going to step in and do job creation work. And if and when that does happen, we have to look back at what is the purpose of work because it's not just to have a job. That's one of the side benefits of work. But it's not the actual benefit of work. I'm going to make a super perverse, super stupid analogy here. It'll probably get us canceled. Imagine that you were a sex worker and imagine you were also a pervert. So you liked the work and you were, you know, banging dudes 24-7 and collecting money. And someone's like, how's your job? You're like, I love it. 
They're like, what do you do for a job? You're like, I get off all the time. And they're like, okay. So what job do you actually do? You're like, I'm a sex worker. Like, okay. So somebody else in the room, you're like, "Mm mm-hmm. Are they getting off? And you're like, I don't know. They pay me to have sex with them. It's not my job to figure out if they're getting off or not. (laughs) What? That's arguably your only job. That's really what they're paying for. Of course, the act, but the act got to lead somewhere. And so if you're just there to have a good time and to collect your paycheck and leave, you're not really being the best sex worker you can be because the, the, what the, what the customer. So if we're making government jobs, which are called make work policies, we should try to get the question of, but what societal benefit, what benefit to distinct groups of consumers or just citizens does this job actually have? And we're going to try to maximize that category so that when we're paying all the employees in aggregate, ideally, it goes even over that. And now it's tenable and it actually pays for itself. And even if it can't pay for itself, there's some reason to use government services at a loss. At least you make it maximize as much social value as possible so it's only losing a little bit of money. What you don't want is two things. One of these is much worse than the other. What you don't want is very little or no value creation, and you're paying out tons of people to do work. Again, they, it's like the analogy with a sex worker. She's having a good time, but it's nice. But also, what about the client, right? What are they doing? It's nice that they're getting work and getting money. It's cool. But, you know, like, who are they helping? The other thing you see in government sometimes is a, an inversion of that. So if this is the zero line here, if you're watching this and not just listening to it, and ideally, value creation is an excess of, of paying out all the workers. That's dope. If it's right around there, even just below, we can justify it's a decent government program. If it's real low, like it sucks and we can do better. Here's a zero line. What if it's negative? There are a bunch of government jobs. Probably, no offense, most of the people that work for the IRS are actually doing a net negative. Most regulators of pharmaceutical uh, industry products, not knowingly and not intentionally, are a net negative. Like the vast majority of people in working in government, it's probably say at least 70%. If you strategically, not just in a political statement, not all at once, if you strategically remove their reason for coming to work and summarily their positions, it would actually boost overall economic output and total happiness in the country because these people, regulators' main job is of a full spectrum of options of what you can be doing as a human. Their job is to take some away. And they ostensibly think that those are the bad options. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. And so a lot of times overburdening regulation, like we have with housing and medicine and taxes and Jesus, education, the whole goddamn thing, a lot of stuff. If you take away people's jobs, whose job it is to improperly and inefficiently regulate others, then removing those jobs is just better for the economy as a whole than even if those jobs were done not so well, like you just, you're doing negative work. It's like if someone was employed as like serial killer or dictator or, you know, R word person, that you know, sexual assault guy, robber, like that's not jobs you're going to pay for in the economy because they degrade the overall value of the economy. There are many regulatory government jobs that do just the same thing. Those we really want to make sure that, oh, and the computer's asleep. We really want to make sure in those cases that when we do have government get in the business of offering employment, it's as high actual ROI as possible or as little downside as possible and ideally not negative ROI, which is really terrible, but a lot of government jobs absolutely are negative ROI. Go to the DMV next time and tell me I'm full of shit. Next question, big implication here is when AI and robotics do almost everything better than humans do, what does that mean for human work? If you have something that for less money and more output does everything as well as a human, remember that multi sort of uh, multi-layered diagram of right in the center is consumer supply and demand, what people want and the goods and services that can improve them. Then we have the vectors of the goods and services. We have corporations making them and we have slots for jobs. We have machines and animals and people floating around that. If the machines just get into the slots super, super well, and there's not really a need to employ humans and animals anymore, the consumer is super, super ultra satisfied, but then humans don't have jobs anymore. What the hell happens then? There are a couple of options. I've spoken about them in a few videos before, but this is one of those things to really take a big sigh of relief 
before approaching because we already have built just together in this little video a discussion about what jobs really mean. So if we have machines that do every job 10 times cheaper and 10 times better than people, that's not something to at face value freak out about because everyone lost their job. There are worse ways of losing their job. If you artificially fuck with the monetary system and get a Great Depression going or ban free trade in various capacities, you also put out everyone of a job, but the vector of goods and services going to consumers either runs super dry or stops altogether. That's really bad. No more hospitals, no more food, no more babysitting, none of that shit exists. If you have machines that for 10 times less price and 10 times more output can fulfill the role to the consumer, it's actually a curious question of why those machines are being employed at all. Because the consumer is giving the machines back something they can use. But if the machines can do everything 10 times better, why would they use it? There is an answer to that question. I'll get to that in just a sec. But what you really have to do is be like, dude, okay, we could freak out about this. We could, we could, we will just a sec. But the machines are doing everything super, super well. That means that central core of why jobs exist is being check plus like you wouldn't believe. Big old fat green plus check mark. Like, man, that's kind of fucking awesome. And so now we have this thing where we look at all these unemployed people. Terrible, I know. But at least it's like, well, everything's being taken care of. And this is where I don't won't get into this too much, but uh, there are tons of options. The first option is this, this idea that AI and robotics do almost everything better than humans do or everything better than humans do is two very, very big distinctions. Almost everything better than humans do means we have an unreal machine workforce to just crank value out. Everything better than humans do means the machines are also squishy like humans. You can test drugs on them like humans. Um, you can promise to give someone five minutes with the real human listening to them, but you lied to them. It wasn't a real human. It was a machine built human. All of a sudden you start to get the, it actually gets in the way of the identity property. Only a real human can be a real human. And there are some jobs for which other humans and potentially machines will need real humans to futz with. Why am I making a big point of this? Because humans almost know, they almost don't farm anymore. 4,000 years ago, the humans that were civilized, almost everyone farmed. That was what you did. That was the job. Before that, hunting and gathering was the job. It was the only job in town, or child rearing and some other bullshit. You get into multiple industrial revolutions and the diversity of jobs goes insane, but people do a lot less of the core work you would think they would do. Like someone looks at a city, someone from 150 years ago, and they look over a big city, modern city, and they're like, wow, must take so many workers to build all that. You're like, mm, yeah, it took a few. Like, okay, so how do the workers hoist all these super heavy you know, building blocks of skyscrapers? Like actually a crane does that. You're like, by itself? You're like, it's got a crane operator. You're like, so it takes hundreds of people to move this crane. You're like, it's just one drunk dude, to be completely honest. Like, he's drunk? Like, yeah, the crane operators are always drunk. God, everyone knows that. They do a great job. So is one dude in a crane magnifying his effort with machines? I don't know, the, an inconsequential number, for like thousands fold? I don't know how much of a fraction. I, I'll tell you this. I can lift some fraction of a crane's weight that it can lift, but I can't lift it to a height at all in any circumstances which the crane can lift to. So you look at it and you're like, so very few, very few of what we see today, building heights, layered cables, designed architectures and phones, um, very few of these things are actually made by humans. You're like, mm-hmm. But so everyone must be unemployed. Like, no, we have like positive, like we have negative unemployment functionally. Like we have multiple jobs for which there are no applicants. And so we, we could have, be at full employment anytime we wanted and we still wouldn't be able to fill the jobs. Oh, holy shit. So then we just have so many things for people to do now, some of them involving tech, some of them by themselves, that used to be everyone did these things like building shit and farming. But now that machines have leveraged us so well, we do other things. Now watch this. When machines do more and more and more of this, they're just going to leverage humans into the things that only humans can do. And there are many, many jobs which are still unfulfilled. For example, if I want 
to get a crew together, just some people to listen to like a new stand-up routine I have. Or just to get some people in my house, I want to be able to feed people. I don't have anyone that lives with me. I'm lonely. These are all true facts, by the way. Super, super appropriate or apply to older folks. I want someone to walk to the store with me and give me good conversation, but I want a fucking human being. I know like I could have a GPT do it, and I know it can be disagreeable if I tell it to, but I have a level of control. There's a degree of authenticity. I just can't get out of that machine. I need a human. And how do I get one? Is there like a website right now? Scott, is there a website where I can go and like get friends to hang out with me? Yeah, there are, especially in like Japan and shit, of course. Especially in Japan because they're running out of fucking people. And so it's very, very low key and most people can't afford it. And it's mostly not proliferating hardly at all. And these are jobs only humans can do. There's a bunch of jobs only humans can do, including testing various things including getting human-centric data. So for example, if you put on AR goggles and you go walk around and look at stuff, where you look, how you look, et cetera, what you do during the day, how you whip up your credit card, what grocery store items, how you interact with your spouse, that's all something machines can study and measure to more appropriately deliver to you and humans like you the best possible goods and services because now they know more about you. Like It looks like people say they like orange pants, but based on the tracking data from what they look at the longest, they actually like purple pants better. Let's make more purple pants. Just as easy as that, and you expound, uh, expand the whole thing into infinity. So it turns out that as machines do more and more work, humans are now less and less bounded to do traditional machine work like typing into things and doing jobs we haven't even conceived of yet. I know that sounds like a fucking excuse. I did conceive of the be my friend job, but guys, remember, try to explain to Benjamin Franklin what the fuck you do as the CFO at Facebook. It was, so I do finances, money stuff. Ben Franklin's like, I understand that. That makes sense. You're okay. What, at what company? Like Facebook. Okay. It's like a book company. Like not really. So you guys make books? No. You run a library? No. So what do you do? You're like, okay. People want to know about each other. He's like, okay, wealthy people. You're like regular people. Mm-hmm. So we give them this like a uh, magic tool for free. He's like free. You're like free. So you don't pay for Facebook. Okay. And they can find any other person and look at pictures of them and videos of them. We'll tell you what a video is in a sec, Ben. No worries. And um, we just scroll through and they they make friends with each other. He's like, so it's people just want to make friends with each other and kind of like look at each other. Uh-huh. And so we build the system for that. And he's like, what the fuck? That's your job? Like, well, I don't do the building. <laughs> My God, I just run the finances. He's like, how many levels away from real work, quote unquote, are you removed? I don't know, infinity. And so when you tell people when AI takes over almost all jobs, but leaves only the genuine human stuff for genuine humans, they're like, oh my God, we're all going to be out of work. Uh, There's like seven or eight billion of us and the lowest fraction ever working on farming and manufacturing and medical care and all the other shit that actually does stuff. And yet we still can't fill all of the jobs that we need even for social media folks and people in this ethereal realm of content production or whatever the fuck. So when AI and robotics do almost all of the work that humans do, two things. One, shit's going to get really fucking good. And two, the kinds of jobs that real humans do will now be some shit that really leans into the real human part because you don't need to lean into your typography skills because a computer can enter data 50,000 times faster and better than you. Amazing. And here's the worst case of all. Let's say that AI and machines do all of the jobs that a human could ever want done for them. We live in paradise. We live in paradise. We say, okay, it's just shy of that, but they do the human jobs enough so well that somehow if we fucking really crank our brain, we could figure out a way that like AI and machines do almost all the work. But the amount of work remaining, we just can't sustain people. It's just not enough money for people. Guess what? If you have robots, it's the simplest analogy. It works at every level of the market. You have robots. And the average robot is five times as productive as a human. Pretty scary. And there's five times the number of those robots out in the wild. If you take 10% as a tax off every robot's yearly produce, If you figure out the math, that's the equivalent of giving a human being like 
just the 10% cut. I was going to say off every robot, we could do it off every robot, but there's five times the number of robots as people. So every human has 5x the robot income, okay, and 5x the robots because the robots are five times more productive and there's five times more of them. 10% of that is like hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. And remember, machines get more efficient and advanced over time anyway, exponentially. So like year one of you not having a job, the robot economy just pays you $500,000. And the year two, it's seven fifty. dollars Year three is $1.3 million. You have no idea where the fuck it's going after that. And you're like, aren't we burdening the machines? Like, nope, it's 10% tax. They don't give a fuck. Holy shit. So... Worrying about human work is a very, very real concern in the coming psychotic economy that we're going to have, but it's almost all good news and very little bad news. It, it, it's kind of being like, all right, you're lonely, right? Like, yeah, I'm lonely. You're in your pajamas and shit and you got your toothbrush, right? Right. I'm going to teleport you into a dance club where all of your best friends ever are going to be together and you're the center of the show and you're going to have six hours of incredible fun. Cool. You're like, oh my God, are you serious? Like, yes. You're like, but, but what do I do with my toothbrush? That's the kind of concern in my eyes. The human employment problem is in the realm of AI and all this crazy shit. For a while, it's not even a problem because humans are so in demand working on human-only things that AI can't possibly get traction on. And when AI can get traction even on those, we're getting so close to that fixing all problems thing that short of the AI turning on us and laser gunning all of us to death, which can always happen with a superior entity, it's nominally easy to support people. Now, here's the thing. What do people do if they're simply given money to exist? We have two things that are happening. One, humans can now spend their money and now they have their own little mini human economy to like buy things from machines that cost money, buy things from other people that, buy, buy, uh, that cost money. Same as always. You have a second concern, a, a degradation and a loss of meaning. And potentially with that goes a uh, kind of people just lose all their motivation and just start expecting the money and they just stop being productive. Technically speaking, if they stop being productive, it's not such a big deal because the machines are so much better. It just doesn't fucking matter. But on the note of kind of the emotional and philosophical implication of not being able to be productive, that is a very legitimate concern. But the way you get traction of that concern is you bring in AI machines and be like, can you re-architect my genome to make me better at certain work, to actually make me useful? And then the computer could tell you, uh, you're not going to be useful in anything in this modern economy because we're already like restructuring the sun at this point. It's like the year 2150 or some shit. You can just like live in a fantasy human world in real life for a while. We can just copy your brain and upload you into the cloud. You can live in the cloud and just fuck around and just bang like 80 trillion hookers an hour or whatever in that. Or you can uh, be sucked up into the machine uh, understanding and your brain and memories conserved, but then your brain re-architected to be a machine that is now productive. Because if what is required to be productive is machine levels of excellence, you're going to have to re-architect yourself into a machine in order to join that economy. Wacky, wacky stuff, right? Here's the only reason I'm saying it. We don't want a situation in which we keep people's jobs around and keep them employed at those jobs just because people should have jobs. Customer outcome, goods and services are the central core of any question about jobs. The details on jobs are two things secondary, and it's almost always, especially long-term, job transition sucks, getting fired sucks, almost all long-term, super, super good news. Remember, we had massive de deindustrializations, so to speak, deutilizations of a human workforce in farming, in industry. Is having that happen in science and having it happen in art going to change things a ton? How many people are artists and scientists? Not that many. So if AI does all that, these people are going to come in and maybe the new economy of humans will be more of a social media economy. And maybe beyond social media and the fake fucking look you get for people at that, maybe there'll be an economy for real, genuine human interactions. That could be a really big deal. It's one of my little mini predictions. I think the human interaction economy is going to skyrocket in the 2030s because We'll all be freed up to do shit like that. We won't have our daily task because machines will do them. Lastly, number four, given this jobs idea, what should your motivation at work be? Should it be to keep your job? Should it be to cozy up to other people so that you don't get fired? Should it be to try to justify why your job is good? Should it be to try to get a pay raise and make as much money? Should it be to work for the weekend? I think it's really good when your personal motivation 
aligns with a grander systemic motivation and grander systemic purpose. It's like if your goal is for your team to win in the football championship playoffs and your team's goal is to win, there's a beauty and serendipity in that. That like if your goal is just to like catch as many footballs as you can on the highlight reel and get a big contract, that's cool. But if your goal is truly 100% aligned to the team, which is to win, there's just all amazing things happen from that kind of synergy. So what I like, and this isn't a definitive statement, this is just my preference, and I think there's something to it objectively, is your, your goal at work shouldn't be to make money per se. Definitely not just to keep your job at all costs. Like Frank thinks he's going to get me fired. He's got another thing coming. But to help people better and better with that end product. And if those end consumers end up being machines, whoever the fuck is buying the shit your company makes, having them have the best time of it possible, finding that the price you're charging combined with the quality of the goods and services and your commitment to always making them better is just so goddamn good. Like if I ever talked to someone who was a real proud employee of, uh, you know, Apple or was in charge of their cell phone division, I'd want to give them a hug because the iPhone's fucking unbelievable. I don't want to imagine my life without it. I, my iPhone kind of like went to sleep and it takes like a minute of hard press to get it up. I didn't know that. So I had to go to the Apple store. Folks, I had to go to the Apple store. I had to drive without GPS. I was like, I sure hope I know where I'm going. I felt so cold and alienated. If I had a really, really good thought about like how to make better videos or write more books, I didn't know where the fuck to write it down. Cause usually I write it down in my notes. I, I felt like a part of me was missing. If that Apple employee comes to work every day thinking, man, I want to make the best iPhone possible for the end user, boy, are they knocking it the fuck out of the park. Boy, does that align with what their job is actually supposed to be. And of course, it gets them paid. It gives them a huge, deep meaning about purpose. I'm here to help people. That's the way I see my job at RP. My job isn't to make tons of money. That's nonsense because we don't run a printing press, Okay. It's not to make software because we can make all kinds of software that does fuck all. We're still making software. It is not even necessarily to get people really good experiences with the software because if you like the way the RP Diet Coach app and the RP Hypertrophy app feel and look and you can track your shit, that's cool. I, we definitely love that, but it's not enough. My goal in work is to get as many people that are willing and able into the shapes of their lives as possible. If I can get you into leaner physique, into a more muscular physique, into a healthier physique that you love more, holy fucking shit am I winning. That's why I come to work. I'm just trying to wag the fucking dog here. Oh, I'm so fucking ethical. It's a fucking weird flex. I'm like SpongeBob again. Oh, gee whiz. I love work, right? That really is, to me, something that makes sense because I don't come to work for my job. I come to work to make the ultimate thing happen, the end point, goods and services that make people better off, that make people happier, that give them what they want. If that's why you come to work every day, low key, somewhere in the back of your mind, you're like, we're doing a goddamn good thing here. Then your motivation to go to work, your sense of purpose, I find for most people, serving others is just fucking awesome. And if that can continue to be your purpose, that's a fucking really, really good thing. So anyway, I said a lot of stuff. Hopefully some of it made sense. Next week, we'll have a video that hopefully makes even more sense. And we'll see you there for that one. Peace, homies.